Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Hunter and FX webinar series. Today, we'll be covering the advanced two-wire and decoder troubleshooting uh, with Dave Mahalik, myself, and Chris Foster. Um, my name is Steve Lidner. I've been with Hunter Industries for about five years, a little over. I've uh, been in the industry for about 30. Dave Mahalik is our field service manager out of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, Mr. Chris Foster uh, hails from Indianapolis. Hi guys, thanks for coming. So my name is Dave Mahalik. I'm the field service manager for the Midwest United States for Hunter. Basically, this this broken up into two parts. The first part I call general concepts. We're just going to go over a whole myriad of different things. Um, how to how to lay out systems, why we ground them, how we ground them, that kind of that type of stuff. And then the, then the second half of it's troubleshooting. Like Steve said, we'll take a break in the middle. I got a little slideshow for you just for some uh, from two some two wire things I've seen over the years. But it's basically for general concepts. We're gonna cover wire paths, grounding, the controllers that we use. I'll hound on you a little bit about wiring connections, and then introduce you to my friend, the ICDHP programmer. So so here's the deal. This is a, a conventional system. We got a controller and a bunch of valves. And we got a wire that runs from the controller to each valve, and then a common wire that goes to every valve. And as systems get bigger and bigger, there's more and more and more wires. Um, get the idea there. So on a two-wire system, we're just going to run a two-wire path wherever wherever we need to install valves and hook decoders between the valve and the two-wire path. One of the really big advantages of, of of using decoder or two wire technology is if we want to add something we can just literally just add it we can just go in find the two wire path and splice it in another decoder or splice in another wire path add on to like for instance go to another another part of a subdivision so this here is a picture and it's probably the, the neatest fully populated 42 station controller i've ever seen that's a picture of a 99 station two wire controller. So you get an idea how much how much wire difference there is in the in the systems, and it's huge. And it's a lot of money, and it saves, and it's a lot of labor installing all that. So one of the things about two wire systems is they're electrically efficient. I'll explain later why they are, but they with just the nature of them, we can run way more stuff at once and only consume the same amount of power. They say it's really easy to expand systems. We're just going to go cut another wire in or bring another wire to the controller and run off to another direction. It helps, at least in some cases, troubleshooting systems. Uh, it, it, just if you have everything after a certain point not working, then you know where the, where to start for troubleshooting. So as far, far as wire paths, and what we call a wire path is a, it's a two-wire cable the run from the controller to the decoders. The wire paths can be spliced, um, and we and we encourage splicing and not having to run multiple wire paths all over. Um, any place you need to, any place where you need to to splice and run off in another direction is no problem at all. And we encourage you to put in multiple wire paths. Um, everybody seems to want to always just bring one wire into the controller. Where for for various reasons, and the biggest one being troubleshooting, the more wire paths, the easier it is to, to diagnose systems. And we encourage you, if you're doing that, well, obviously use the proper connectors, and I'll hound you about connectors more than once here today. Um, I've put the pipe, we just put the wire in the trenches. We encourage you to use a different color wire for each wire path. Um, it really it really makes troubleshooting down the road easier and the, it's all the same cost so the, the, there's no additional cost to use different colored wires so so in these distances very little bit but on, on an acc controller using the standard 14 gauge wire that we call id1 we can go 10,000 feet and that's measured from the furthest out decoder back to the controller it does not include all the branches that's a long ways 
If we use the 12 gauge wire ID2, it's actually we can go to 15,000 feet or three miles. One of the things we learned a long time back on two wire systems is don't, you never want to loop the wire paths to each other. You can, the old belief was that you increased power by doing that. You actually didn't increase power at all. And you made the system so virtually impossible to diagnose when you get a short out there. Let me talk to you a little bit about grounding. So why do we ground? Well, grounding has two, two things that it does for us. One of them is much bigger than the other in our in this case. So, so when we ground devices, whether it's a controller or a two-wire path or it's or a decoder, what we're doing is we're it's lightning protection, it's surge protection. We're trying to stop the surge of electricity from making it any further and doing any more damage than it has to. So what grounding does is we're literally going to take, try to at least attempt to take the surge of electricity and dissipate it into the soil. And that's why it's called grounding, because we're trying to dump the electricity into the ground. The other thing it does is reduces electrical interference. It's not a huge deal compared to what it does with the grounding, but it definitely grounding controllers, grounding the wire paths helps with noise problems. So how do we ground? Well, basically, we two different ways we ground. We either use a ground rod, which is a which is a copper clad steel rod, and they're installed vertically. In other words, we're going to just pound it straight down into the ground. And the other one is a grounding plate. And grounding plates are horizontally installed. It's a copper clad plate. There typically there's 96 inch and 36 inch plates. For the most part, we use the 96 inch plates, and these get installed. 30 to 36 inches deep. Um, and that's to get them down into where there's more moisture in the soil. So one of the things you got to understand about with, with grounding is what we call a sphere of influence. This is the area around the grounding device that when it when it when it's doing its job and it's just trying to dissipate the surge into the soil, this the sphere around the rod becomes electrically charged. And so what you want is you don't want any electronic de devices inside that sphere. If they are, it's likely that the surge will jump right back into what you're actually trying to protect. And it looks like this from the side. So it, it's it's the twice the length of the rod crossed and it's twice the length of the rod deep. The deep really doesn't matter. There's nothing down there that we care about anyways. There's no pipes or wires down there. It's the area around it that's of concern. So the grounding plates, the sphere looks quite a bit different. Um, it's still the same thing. It's, it's twice the length, it's twice the width. The, the shape of it's quite a bit different. You need to be aware of that when you're when you're installing them. Just the nature of the plate, it doesn't go very deep. The, the sphere doesn't go down deep like it does with the rod. Again, it doesn't really matter. We don't care what's down there anyways. As far as grounding controllers, so we're either going to use a rod or a plate, one or the other, or both. A lot of times we use both on a controller. Um, if you are using rods, don't ever cut a ground rod. If you can't pound it in all the way, you either need to go to a plate or attempt with another rod in another location. If they're not in all the way, they might as well not be there at all. And we use a six gauge wire minimum. And this needs to be solid core wire going between the, the controller and the grounding rod or plate. If it's a plate, that will come with the wire already attached to it for you. On a rod, we'll have to add our own. And we just use acorn nuts to attach to the ground rods. One of the things with the, with the actual ground wire, the six gauge wire, it needs to be nice, smooth sweeping turns, no sharp corners. Um, if you if you have a sharp corner on a, on a ground wire like that, the surge is likely to jump off of the wire on the on that corner. So we want everything nice, smooth sweeps. We're trying to just make it trying to make it easier. You probably all heard the the electricity takes a path of least resistance. So a sharp corner is resistance. Also on the controller, you never want to put the ground wire in the in the sleeve with anything else. It should be it should be all by itself. Don't certainly don't want it in with the with the two wire cables, and you don't want it in with the one ten wire either. 
Hey Dave, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I have the first question out here, um, which is a question that comes up a lot. And they ask, you know, how do you decide if you use a ground plate or a ground a ground rod? So, so typically, especially in the, the part of the world that I, I work in, we usually can just use a rod. But the decision is made by two things. It's the, it's mostly the soil makeup. If you're in a rocky soil and you can't get a ground rod fully driven the eight feet, use a plate. But if you're also, if you're in, in like sandier soils, tend to not, not conduct electricity very well, sometimes then a plate makes more sense too. But it's, if you can, if you got, if, like I say, if you got heavy soil and you can get them rods in, rods are quite a bit cheaper and a lot easier to install. But the decisions, the soil is really what decides. Awesome, thank you. Thank you guys for the question. Keep them coming. Yeah. And then Dave, I got something to add too on that grounding. I get this question a lot. What's the recommended um, depth to bury a ground plate? So it's, I, I, see them, I see the recommendations at either 30 or 36 inches. And any place down in that area is good. What Basically what it is, is when once you get that deep, once you get down to like three foot deep, there's almost always moisture that far that down far down in the soil, and it's that moisture that we're looking for. It helps conduct electricity. Thank you. Again, eight feet away from the from the controller. Oh, uh, that's a, that's a, just a given. We're using eight foot rods and eight foot plates, so you need to be at least eight foot away to get get outside of that sphere of influence. This is just a, a a diagram of how you would do a controller where we're doing a rod and a plate together, and this is common in different areas. But the main thing is that we need to stay perpendicular to the wire paths. But as far away as we possibly can get, we want to keep everything apart from each other. As far as for decoders and surge arresters, it's really pretty much the same thing. We're either going to use a rod or a plate, don't cut rods off. We're going to use six gauge wire to attach the two together. Greater the better. Perpendicular to the wire path. Like I say, it's, made, it's almost the same thing. So here's what it looks like when you're ground a, a decoder. This is one of our ICD decoders with the uh, internal grounding. So we're, like I say, it's perpendicular to the wire path. In this case, they used a ground plate 36 inches deep. The one thing about this diagram, though, that's wrong is this we because remember i told you you want to make nice smooth sweeping turns well that's about as opposite of a smooth sweeping turn as you can get when you stick them two wires in a wire nut they're opposed to each other what you really want to do is we use one of these they call these things split bolts you take the two wires put it in that opening and then just tighten the bolt on itself a little bit of dielectric grease goes a long ways in one of these um, just to make them last longer but Split bolts are, are far preferable to using wire nuts and grease packs on grounding. I have one more question coming in, Dave, too. Um, yeah. I think it deals with the resistance of grounding. And Greg asks, uh, can you just talk for a second about checking the ground with a megger and the use of gem ground enhancement material? Just what kind of readings yeah. they're looking for, possibly? So, so basically, and I got a slide with Jim on it later, but um, we're looking, we're looking for, we're hoping to get a resistance reading of 10 ohms or less, which is measured with a, a what we call a mega. It's a, it's a special meter, that basically induces a voltage into the ground and, and and measures how well that whole setup conducts electricity. They're, um, I say most of where I cover in the in the Midwest, we have heavy soils. Our readings are almost always good. But that that's that's how you test them. Like I say, it has to be a mega, and that's the kind of readings that you're looking for. The the so just to clarify, ten ohms about, or less. Ten ohms or less is what we're what we're looking for. The the ground the grounding material, and there's there's a couple of them. There's gem and power setter, the two most common ones. Are a they're a metal oxide powder that we that put down both underneath and on top of the grounding plates. It helps them conduct electricity. Obviously, it would work on a rod, except that we pound the rod in so the stuff won't get down where it needs to be. But 
that 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 enhancement material greatly improves grounding when you're using plates. It typically it will bring that resistance reading down to less than half of what it was originally, which is significant. So as far as planning your grounding, how you set grounding up, the first thing, obviously, all, all controllers, all decoder controllers especially, need to have the controller grounded. That's the most what, ex, the one most expensive component in an irrigation system. Um, so you definitely want to ground it, try to protect it. And from there, we're going to ground the end of each wire path. Then the rule of thumb is, um, one every one surge arrest for every 12 decoders or 1,000 feet, whichever comes first. In higher lightning areas, like down in Florida, we would probably we would go down. Usually, typically there they use they go every five decoders or 500 feet. From there, we add them. Uh, optionally, and we've learned this in recent years, it it makes a lot of sense to ground the first decoder on each wire path. We, what we're doing, this is trying to protect another, just another effort to protect the controller. And we've also found that for whatever reason, that first decoder and wire path is the most likely one to fail. So it seems likely to, logical to put a ground rod there too. Again, that's just, that's just an option. You don't, you don't have to, and it doesn't, it's not, a, a, you know, but if you're looking to, if you're looking to try to help your system out, that's a good, good idea. Then it's the same thing, eight, eight or 10 foot rods or, or the plates perpendicular to the wire path at each one of them locations. This is a note our ICD decoders, which is what ACC and ACC2 controllers use, have integrated grounding. It's built right into every decoder. You just ground every, every 12th decoder or 1,000 foot. It's not a separate device. The dual or i system does use a separate surge arrestor. Um, this is just a, this is a grounding plate. They say they're either four by 36 or the, the more common one is four by 96 inch. Just a quick look at what they look like installed. Um, so some of the other stuff, CAD weld is a, is a connector. It's actually a device that uses gunpowder to actually literally fuse the wire and rod to each other. There, it's a, it's, it's a little bit time consuming, a little bit expensive, highly effective though. And the nice thing, when, once a CAD weld connection has been made right, it never has to be maintained because we've literally welded the two pieces of metal to each other. Just a picture of a split bolt that we use to connect wires to wires. And this is, this is the other uh, ground enhancement material power set. So just try to drive home the, the idea of grounding. It's just a typical system. Like I say, optionally, we ground the first connection every thousand feet or 12 coders. You can, and, and we recommend that it's 10 ohms or less resistance. You can ground however often you want, as long as it makes sense. I mean, financially, it won't make sense at some point, but it is truly more the merrier. So here, here's how what grounding works, or at least what we're attempting to, to do here. When you take a lightning, we're trying to hold that surge within between them two grounding devices. Anything in between is is vulnerable for to damage. But it, what we're trying to do is not let it get out into the rest of the system. We certainly don't want it to get back to the controller and then out the other wire paths, and you know it could get real bad. But that's the idea. We, we can't stop lightning. Lightning will do what lightning decides it's going to do. We're just trying to minimize damage. So I introduced controllers that we use. This is the Hunter decoder controllers. Um, our, our workhorse for the last 15 years has been the AC controller. It, it uh, Put this module, the ADM 99 module, into an ACC controller. You turn it into a 99 station decoder controller. It gives you six wire paths to the field. 
United States, you can pass. Okay, I'll try this again, ACC2 controller. So this, this is our new controller. Um, if you're familiar with the, the Lebsor lighting transformer, it's basically the same display and setup we have on it. We like that. So this is a nice new modern setup, big, big bright screen on it. Not sure what the, why my screen's jumping around. Um, all, all new design. We got away from the old uh, Hunter, Hunter dial that we've always used to this new setup where we're using a, uh, just one knob and a bunch of a bunch of keys to do different stuff. Pretty modern looking. Um, compatible with the same ICD decoders as the ACC is. Um, up to 225 stations in decoder. That's in 75 station increments. It's got to, one of the cool things they did with this. It's got a reversible face pack, and it doesn't sound like much, but it's actually for service. It's a really nice setup. Basically, all you got to do is take the face pack. Pull the top of it out towards you, lift it out of there, push it back through the opening, and put it in the in the back of the door facing the other direction. So now you can you can work on the uh, on the terminals or on the wires and see the face pack at the same time. But when you do that, when you reverse it, it's got a little magnet in there that it clicks and it it automatically goes into diagnostics modes for you. We're, we're basically assuming if you're reversing it. You're working on a controller you're going to want to be in diagnostics it will still operate everything normally though so so what we're what we're seeing is in most most situations the the face pack gets reversed to this facing to the inside and it just stays that way because there's no real reason to turn it back the other way the other cool thing and i uh, especially on these on this controller is extremely heavy the acc was also so mount, putting a mountain of wall mount controller this kind of heavy by yourself is almost impossible. They're so heavy and cumbersome. So what they made was a little bracket, and you just you just level and mount the bracket to the wall, and the controller just literally hangs on it. And then you you mount the plate, you hang the controller, you one screw inside the cabinet, and locks the thing down on the wall. It's way easier, way safer to install this this controller. As far as the controller itself, basically, it's a pretty capable controller. 32 programs, 10, 10 start times per program with a 12-hour max run time. And just the way this thing will run in any, it'll run stations in any order. You can have a station in a program more than once. Um, you can have, we have a setup we call blocks, which is that runs multiple stations at the same time. They can be mixed into a program with, with stations. There's also delays between stations that can be programmed in. So it's got what we call a, a non-water window. It's by program. We tell that program a, a water window that is not allowed in any for any reason to water during. Um, you just set them in, and it's like I say, it's by program. You're telling it no matter what I did wrong, no matter what the what the the sensors might tell you to do, you're not allowed to water at this time. And the example I use is if the controller happens to water like the entranceway to a hospital where you absolutely cannot have that sidewalk wet in the morning you can put a no water window in there to guarantee that that's always the case but at any time you don't want unwatered water that's what it does for you it's also got calendar days off which this is a 365 day road rolling calendar you tell you can go into the future and tell it the days that it is not allowed to water so these could be like you could turn it off on Wednesdays because Thursday's Mo Day. You could do it on July 3rd because you know people are going to be on the lawn on July 4th and you want it to be dry. Or any dates, whatever they are, whatever they're for. If it happens, you know, whatever reason you might want it dry, you can go into the future and just program it in. Then you don't have to. It also has a visual program summary, which basically goes with the programmable day the, the non-water window to see if you have overlaps between the program and the non-water window and in this example everything's fine the only one that runs after 10 a.m is program five and it doesn't have a no water window so it's, this thing comes 75 station modules and the, the base model comes with one module installed you can add up to two more for 225 station capability it's three wire paths per module 
each of the modules has built-in automotive fuses, and we give you two spare fuses. They're right up here in the corner, and a little tool to pull the fuses out with. Um, they're just standard automotive fuses. You can go down to the auto parts store and get replacements if you need to. The the fuses are just another piece of surge protection, trying to save the controller. So our new our new two wire controllers, the Easy Decoder System. Basically, Easy is a, an add-on module. We can use it on either an HCC or an ICC2 controller, which are capable HCC with Hydrowise and ICC2 with the Centralis control platforms. It's just a simple module that you add to existing slots on the controller. Um, it'll bring you up to 54 stations plus a pump master valve. So one of the big differences, and we'll get more into this later, with easy decoder system versus conventional, well, for lack of a better term, conventional decoder systems, it uses 24 volts AC. That means you don't have to have any special voltmeters to, to, to work on it with. We don't need to use any special connectors, although we still recommend that you use the 3M connectors. Um, any, any, you can use any kind of connector you want on it. Use um, King wire nuts if you want. It doesn't matter. The, the wiring distances are dramatically decreased, though. With, with 12 gauge wire, we can go to 3,000 feet. With 14 gauge wire, it's about 2,200, and it goes down from there. It's very dependent on wire gauge. We can get away with using smaller wire, but our, our distances we get become drastically reduced. No special connectors, uh, and no surge arresters needed. Just the difference in the system, partially because of the 24 volt system, we don't need in we don't need in field surge arresters. Still need to ground the controller. It's got two two-wire paths, a built-in programming port down, just like any Hunter controller's got built-in programming port. It's got a little a little LED when you are programming, to let you know what you're doing. We can do PMV, we can do pump master valve either from the controller or from the module um, with the decoder. So just to, just to give you an idea, they're a little bit smaller than the ICD decoder. They're gray instead of black. It's two solenoids at a time. There's only single station decoders. It's got this built-in LED that, which when the when the decoder's operating, the LED flashes. It's green LED and it flashes. It's nice and bright. Um, really helps with diagnosing what's going wrong. If the green light's blinking and the and the valve's not running, you've probably got a bad solenoid or a connection between the decoder and the solenoid. If it's supposed to be running and the, and the decoder's not blinking, that's probably a bad decoder. Again, programmable like the ICD in the dual. Uh, we use the same color-coded red and blue color-coded wires. It's not as critical on this, but we still use the same colored wires. Black for our decoder output or for our solenoid output. Waterproof. So this is the ICD HP, and unfortunately, it doesn't work with Easy. I'll go out to show you this later. It does work on the rest of the systems. It just doesn't work with Easy yet. We'll eventually have a programmer for this system, but at the moment we don't. So the decoders have to be programmed at the controller before installing. So now I'm going to go into a little bit about understanding. The black magic of decoders. Just give you some basics on them. Basically, decoders are placed in line between the controller and the, and the actual valves. They're connected by by two wire path ID wire. It can be programmed to activate more than one valve. You can have a manifold up to six valves in it um, that all run off one decoder. Any and all of them can run at once. So you sort of think of a decoder like a like an old home phone system where we're going to make a the we're going to make a call and then the decoder is going to answer that call. One of the things that's different we use we use what we call pulsating DC or a square wave signal. It's not AC voltage, 
And because that's this is part of why the standard test equipment doesn't work so well on decoder systems. It's actually, besides being a square wave, it's at 1.2 hertz for normal AC voltage that we're used to, it's at 60 hertz, 60 times a second. This is only 1.2 times a second of the transition. That, but it, and the, that that 1.2 hertz in the square wave is how we can get them tremendous distances out of these systems. How we can go two miles on a wire path. The easy system doesn't. It uses 24 volts AC, and that's why it doesn't have near the distance capabilities. And it's at 10,000 feet on on 14 gauge wire, 15,000 on 12 gauge wire. The i core dual system is half of that. 5,000 and 7,500, and easy on 14 gauge wires, 2,295. So the wire we use, we call ID wire. It's, it's a twisted red and blue wire. Um, the standard is 10 is ID one. We call it. It's 10,000 feet from the, from the furthest out decoder to the controller. It's color coded, and we actually offer it in eight different colors of wire. Um, and it's, there's some unique stuff about it. main thing. The wire is twisted inside that jacket. It does it does three things for us. The big one is it helps with suppressing surges. Anytime you twist wires, it it, it makes it less um, it makes it less desirable for for electricity to flow down. And so what we're trying to do is get the surge to go into the ground rod. So we're trying to discourage it by twisting the wire. Anytime you twist any two filaments together, you make them stronger than the two by themselves. So it's stronger. And, and anytime you twist wires, it helps with electrical interference. And, and keep in mind that all this stuff is basically we're burying little microprocessors out in the ground. So electrical interference can be a problem with these systems. So I get this question all the time. Can we use other wire? Do we have to use your wire? Well, the answer is yes, you can use her, anybody else. You can use other wire, but there's some things that have to be obviously, we need two wires, we need two conductors. They gotta be, they gotta be solid copper and they gotta be at least 14 gauge for the, for the ACC systems. If, if they're not solid, the corrosion problems will, will happen faster and we have problems with corrosion anyways. Twisted or stranded wire is notorious for having problems with corrosion. So it's gotta be solid copper, it's gotta be 14 gauge, and it's gotta be direct berry wire. So as far as when we're, when we're laying these systems out and we beg all installers, give us at least five feet of slack wire at each, at each decoder location. Um, basically, if you take and pull a loop of wire up to your belt loop, that'll be that'll be plenty, and that'll be in the ballpark of five feet anyways. Um, what we want to do is make sure that you can get all the components out out of the valve box and on on the ground for servicing. We want to get all the connectors and the decoder right out of that box. It makes it so much easier to work on. There's nothing worse than having wires that are too tight, and when you need to get it to the decoder, you can't even move it because it's, it's down there so deep in the box. So give us five feet, please. The other thing we get is, do we have to use them connectors? Um, basically, we, yes, you do have to use them. Um, on the, we, we've tested all the different manufacturers' uh, connectors, and this one, the 3M, is, is just hands down, in our opinion, it's the best one. It's got the best grease in it. It, it holds the wires um, into the wire nut better than the other ones do. It holds the wires into the grease pack better than the other ones do. It's just a better connector. It, it passes our test that we've done on it better than any of the rest of them. There's others that meet the, the electrical specs. They're just, in my opinion, they're not as good. And the whole thing is, over, you can put anything in to begin with and it'll work, but over time, you'll have issues if you, if you don't use the right connectors and put them in correctly. Um, and, that, and anytime any of the splices you do, they need to be in the same connector. So this is the whole thing. Keep in mind, 
on a regular on electric a regular irrigation system, the them wires going out to the valves are only on for just moments, just for a few minutes, and not even every day. And on a decoder system, them wires are live 24/7. You can use the other connectors, but the chances are you're going to get callbacks sooner. One of the things I point out to people on, especially on systems that are more than more than two or three years old, about 50% of the problems we see, we chase back down to connectors, either Nixon wires or un, either improper connectors or improperly installed connectors. And for the output side on the on the solenoid side of the decoders. I recommend the, the smaller 3M, it's DBOB it's called. It's a little bit more money than the others, but it's the same thing, hands down, it's the best connector there is, and it works great when you're connecting surge arresters to decoders or de decoders to decoders in large manifolds. It, uh, it, it's actually really convenient to use that smaller connector instead of them great big ones. So we're gonna run you through programming of the Coders, both from the controllers and using our handheld programmer. So the ACC controller, and this is programming at the at the controller, not with the handheld. Um, you cannot, in, in, in any case, you can't program two station two decoders with the same station number on the on the ACC decoders because of the two-way communications. If if it has two decoders with the same address, when we turn an address on, they both answer back to the controller at the same time. The controller doesn't understand what it just heard, and it sends an off command to them, and then just skips them and moves on to the next thing. So you definitely can't have two station two two decoders with the same station number. And when you're programming from the controller, it it programs the station sequentially. In other words, if you put uh, so you put station seven in for the first station on the decoder on a four station, it's gonna make the second output eight, the third nine, the fourth 10. It, it, it has the one you're programming at the ACC controller, it's sequentially. And then any any decoder and any station of any decoder can be set as a pump master valve. I encourage everybody to, to just use single station decoders for your master valves. Um, just it's, a, it's more convenient to do it that way. Sensor decoders, program them just basically, just like regular decoders, we're just gonna program a little bit more in it because we're gonna teach it whether it has a flow sensor or a, or a click type device connected to it. The one thing we encourage people, if you're using sensor decoders and you're using a flow sensor on ACC, we always set the address to number five. You don't have to, but the only thing that can be set to sensor address number five is the flow sensor. That way, everybody that's, that's working on one knows where to look for it. And it gives you a, a free sensor for it, not that you probably are going to have four other sensors hooked up, but you could. Hey, Dave. Yeah. The um, question that comes up a lot is just the difference between a programmable decoder and a non-programmable decoder programmed at the clock. Could you go over that real quick? I know we've done both over time. Um, you, oh, you like our like the old uh, like the old Viking type decoders that were not programmable. Sure. Yeah, just the so, difference between having a programmable decoder or a non or yeah. controller based. So. So, and we're pretty much the only people that are doing this. What what we do with our decoders is we we assign a station number to the decoder, and then the controller just sends out a command to turn on that station number. Where in the rest of the systems and and in our older systems too, each each decoder had its own its own unique serial number, and these ones actually have a serial number. We just don't use it. And what we did was we programmed the serial number into the controller. The big difference in this is if you have a problem with the controller and it has to be replaced, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to re-enter in them serial numbers for all them decoders. Where on these systems, if something happens to the controller, you don't have to do anything except replace the controller and program it. 
because it's just going to it's just sending out station numbers and the decoders have been set with the station number it's actually to me it's a way better way to do it uh, makes for make life a lot simpler down the road with the setup okay as far as programming the on an ACC2 controller and one of the things you'll see that's different about the ACC2 is the programming port is not on the module like on the rest of them it's up on the it's up on the main panel um, but it's still the same setup we're going to put the red and blue wires in the holes and on all of these it does not matter which wire goes in which hole just red in one and blue in the other check the connected decoder to the port you're just on the dial we're going to go to the decoder screen we're going to select program a decoder then we're going to need to read the decoder and in this case we're going to read it on the from the programming port it has the ability to read decoders out in the field but that's not what we're doing we're programming it so we're just going to we're going to read the, what's in the programming port when you do it'll bring up and it'll tell you everything it knows about that decoder in this case it's a four station decoder um you set the you set the outputs to whatever station you want them to be it does not have to be in numerical order it doesn't care we can leave blanks and we can leave blanks in any location in any station number or output number we want the one thing i will tell you is these two settings here power factor and inrush my best advice to you is do not touch these leave them at two and five they affect the they affect the amount of power coming out of the decoder going to the solenoid the only time we change them is sometimes for it's usually just for pump starts that draw a little bit more than a than a regular solenoid would draw and we need to increase the, the power factor to give it a little bit more up sometimes we need to increase the inrush to get it to pull the relay in um, my my advice is if you if you think you need to change some settings give me a call give somebody a hunter tech service call and talk to us about it before you just go changing it. When you when you change the power factor in rush, you're actually stealing power available power away from everything else in the controller when you do that. So I mean it's there, we use it when we have to, but we only use it when we have to. As far as programming the easy decoder, same we've got the same programming port, but it's a little bit different on easy. So what, what we do is you first you start the station that you want to program the decoder to first on the on the, just on the face pack of the controller turn on the station you want then you put the wires in the programming port and then you press the the, pr the programming button and then when you do that the green light will light up let you know you're programming the the led light on the decoder will light up to let you know you're doing it and then and then and my advice in this is for and it doesn't matter how you program a decoder as soon as you program a decoder with indelible ink write it on the decoder um all decoders look as look the same and you'll never remember what station number you put in when you're doing more than one at a time and even if even if later on down the road it's nice to be able to look at it and see what number it's supposed to be so again a little bit different on easy with when we're doing pump master valve if you want the pump master valve to be a decoder we run a jumper from the pmv output on the on the module of the controller over to the decoder module i mean to the pmv terminal on it and that when we do that that tells the module that it needs to send the signal out for the pump master valve on the two wire path now when we're to, and to program that decoder we're going to we're going to program it with no no stations running we're just going to hit the program button on the module and it'll program the the decoder in the port to be the master valve say so the big thing is if you're going to use you got to remember if you're going to use a decoder as your pump master valve you have to put the jumper on if not then you can just hardwire it to the controller I have a question out here, Dave. Uh, what gauge it, wire should the jumper be? It's, I, th I think anything's fine. Um, I, I advise everybody to put in 14, though. Yeah, almost everybody's got some 14 gauge wire in the truck. So that's what I would use. You could probably get away with a little bit lighter, but why bother? 
Okay, so the this is, and I call I call this my friend, the ICDHP handheld programmer. Um, this was originally developed to do nothing more than program decoders, but it's evolved into a wonderful troubleshooting device. Just some of the some of the things you can do with it. We can uh, we can just plug the the programmer onto a decoder and get get information like what to what if we plug it on. It'll tell us what what type of decoder it is, whether it's a one, two, four, six station or a sensor decoder. It'll show us what station each output's programmed to. It'll give you give you status information like just the, the decoder state. Normal is what you're hoping to see. It could tell you that it's damaged. It could just be blank. It'll tell you the current the amount of current that's being drawn through that decoder at the given time. It'll tell us the voltage at the at the decoder, and then also tell us what if there's a solenoid attached to the outputs and whether that solenoid is active at the moment or not. This is all really helpful information when you're troubleshooting systems. We can we can uh, we say we can measure voltage. We can check current and milliamps or current, and we use we use milliamps for diagnosing problems on two wire systems a lot. And you can turn stations on and off, so you don't even have to have a handheld radio. If you got the program, you can just use it to turn solenoids on and off for testing. And you can and you can program and reprogram decoders in the field. When you're programming in the field, you do have to have power on as the controller. You can also update firmware. If we come out with a, a new firmware adding features to, to decoders, you can use it to you can use the programmer to put them updates into the decoders. Um, they don't the updates don't come on or come around very often. We just did one a bit over a year ago that had to do with the ACC2 controller. We added some features for it. We can also set up and test uh, sensors with it. You can you can hook this thing up to a flow sensor and see if the flow sensor works. We can hook this thing up to a controller and, and simulate a sensor to prove that the controller works. To say it's a, it's a a whole lot of things this thing can do. Wireless programming and not diagnostic meter. It saves a lot on install because we can we can install first and program later. A lot of diagnostics in it. Yeah, and when you're when you're using this, like I told you before, on the ACC controller, you have to program in numerical sequence. With the handheld programmer, you don't. It's in any order you want. And it allows you to put blanks in for future use too. So it's it's it uses wireless what's called induction to, to talk between the, the programmer and the decoder. You put this little cup on the bottom of the decoder and, and it talks through through this to it so you don't have to undo any wire connections to get at it. It's, it actually has a range of about an inch. So if you do, if somebody didn't install it with real tight wires and the decoder's laying down the bottom of a box and can't really get it up to where you can put the programmer on. If you can put the programmer down and get within about an inch of the bottom of that decoder, it'll it'll, it'll read it and you can program it. I'm not encouraging you to install them that way, but if you do, it'll work. We use that for our, our on our golf line. We actually can program the decoder right off of, from the top of the sprinkler because the decoder sets right on underneath the lid. This complete package comes with everything, including nice, nice carry box. Even comes with four batteries. I have another question, Dave. Is uh, yeah. from Carl. Is the new programming cup released and available? No, not at this point. I think it's coming pretty quick. I know what he's talking about. We've did a modification to give it a little bit more range. They're not into production quite yet, though. So here we go. Now we'll get into the we'll get into the real meat of it. So basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between conventional and decoder systems, the tools we need for working on them. Then I try to break it down into into types of problems, and then the troubleshooting methods that we use for them them different types of problems. 
then could give you a couple examples just to try to put it all together at the end. Okay, so basically on conventional system, we have six, you know, 120 volts at 60 hertz coming into the controller, and then we could out, come out, we call it 24 volts, it's usually 26 to 27 volt AC voltage at 60 hertz coming out of them. And that's what conventional test equipment likes to see and knows how to how to read. But on a decoder system, we still come in the same thing, 120 volts, 60 hertz. But what, what we come out with is this pulsating voltage. It's actually about 35 volts, but um, could, there's, this could be some variance to how far down the wire path it is. But it's at 1.2 hertz, pulsating DC voltage or a square wave, and the standard test equipment does not know how to deal with this. If you ever hooked up a regular voltmeter to a 102 wire system, the voltage bounces all over the place. It actually bounces back and forth between two general areas, and you can use that once you know what's, what it should look like, but it's a little odd. <clears throat> this is a sine wave. This is what it looked like if you hooked, used, hooked up an oscilloscope to a, to a station output on a conventional controller. This is what the signal looks like on the two-wire path, and this is what it looks like when we're send when the when we send a signal down. We send a whole bunch of real fast little pulses down that wire to to tell the decoder to turn on or off, whatever it might be. So, on a, on a conventional system, we got a wire that goes to every valve and a common wire that goes to everything and we ground the controller. So on a, on a decoder controller, we're gonna run wire path wherever we, wherever we need to, wherever it makes sense, to get to the valves, attach a decoder between the wire path and the valves. And now we're not only gonna ground the controller, but we also gotta ground out in the field too. Keep in mind that, that volt, there's always that, that 30 some volts pulsating DC voltage out there. Then every so often we send a signal down there to tell a decoder to turn on or off. So here's one of the other big differences. On a conventional system, we send 24 volts out the wire path, turns that solenoid on, and it draws about 250 milliamps or a quarter of an amp. 100 solenoids tend to be a little bit lower than that. They're usually closer to 200, but we still call them 250. On a decoder system, we got that weird voltage coming in to the decoder, but coming out of the decoder, we'll, we'll, a meter will read it. Usually, my meter reads the voltage coming out of a decoder at about 14 volts AC. It's, it's a little bit higher than that, but it's actually coming out, at, it's at 500 hertz. And because of the low voltage in that high frequency, we're able to trick a solenoid into to coming on with way less current usage. It actually only draws about 40 to 50 milliamps, about a fifth of what a what a conventional system does. So that means we can run five times as many stuff at once. It's always hot. The voltage is always on the two-wire path. Hey, Dave. So far, um, I, yeah. Oh, no, Don had a question. I, I think he covered it, but I just want to make sure because it's an interesting one. And he asks, does the decoder convert the DC current to AC to open the solenoid? Yeah, yeah, it does. So it's, it, 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 it's, it's essentially AC, but yes, it, the decoder changes it. And it, the main thing it does is it changes its frequency. It, it's, it's a way faster signal. Because what's coming down the two-wire path is only 1.2 hertz, and what's coming out of the decoder is 500 hertz. But it's essentially AC voltage coming out. Great, thank it's you. Actually, technically, it's not either AC or DC. It's a little bit different, but the big thing is we we speeded it up, and that's what makes it cross a little current. So as far as diagnostics, the ACC. Decoder module, the ADM99, has um, four LED lights to tell us what's going on on them. There's programming port. So 
So here's how the lights work. And, this, and the thing that I'll, I'll tell you right away, and you'll see it at the end, if you remember that green is good, that that's the big thing. And that's what we're always looking for. When I walk up to an ACC controller, I open it up, and I want to see the green line status light. So the rest of the lights, the decoder fault light, normal's blank. It's just it doesn't do anything. So you want to see that's what you want to see when you open one up. You want to see that be blank. If it's steady red, it at least believes that the module itself is bad. If it's blinking red, it's telling you that there's a short out in the field, either a shorted solenoid or probably a shorted decoder. It could be a short on the two-wire path. In other words, the wires are touching each other. But if it's blinking, it's a short. If it's steady, it's usually a fault with the module. The line activity light, again, blank is blank is normal. It's not doing it when there's nothing going on. It's not doing anything. It blinks green when it's irrigating. And steady red, again, is it's telling you that it believes there's a problem with the module. In either of these, what the thing to do if you see if you see the red light either blinking or on steady, is disconnect the field wires and see what happens to the light. If you disconnect it and the light stays red, the module is bad. But if you disconnect it and the light goes out, it's telling you you got a short out in the field somewhere. The same thing if it's blinking, it says there's a short. The communicating light does a couple things. Um, normal's, normal's blank. When it sends the signal down the two wire path, and this is very, very quick, it blinks green. But you almost, unless you're steering right at it, you won't even notice that it does it. It's so quick. And it blinks, it blinks amber or yellow when we're programming decoders through the module. I say the one that I tell everybody, just remember, green is good. So if you, if this light is blank when you open up the controller, that module is probably shot. It could be the other module in the controller that we call the master module, but usually if that, if that lights out, the ADM99 module is bad. And if it's blinking green, and it seldom is, but when everyone's blinking green, that module is definitely bad, replace it. And then green is good. Steady green is what we want to see. They say if all you remember is green is good, then you're getting something out of this. So as far as the diagnostics on the ACC, and it's got quite a few of them, um, we go to, if you go to the decoder screen and then choose diagnostics, there's a whole bunch of different stuff we can do. So we get live current draw, um, and it's by module, and it's, it's, always, it's always there and it's live. So and in this case, it's showing you that module one's got a current draw of 625 milliamps. That's high. That's telling me there's a problem on that module. Module two at 85 and it's active. In other words, it's running stations. That's probably fine. Probably only running just one station. And module three at 40 milliamps and it's inactive or it's not running anything. That's probably fine too. Um, I always advise everybody when you got a controller that's up and running, fully populated, and there is no problems, you should note them milliamp readings. And then you can refer to them later. So then all you gotta do is go check your current draw and see see how things are doing. We can do decoder inventory over the wire path. Basically, what this does from the controller, we can we can call out and it'll it'll talk to all the decoders and they will report back and it'll give us a listing of all the decoders that are on that on this on the line and operating. It'll give us a, a percentage, a com percentage. In other words, how well it's talking to the um, controller. If it's not 100%, if it's less than 100, you're probably looking at some kind of wire connection problems. And it'll tell you if the update's available. Um, if, if the update available would mean that there's a, there's a difference in the versions of decoders. Um, if you see this, get a hold of get a hold of me or tech service to see what to do. You shouldn't run into that as an issue. It's got a built-in wire tracking mode. Basically, what we do is we can we have it gives us the ability to change the output of the module from that pulsating DC voltage to 24 volts AC, and then standard test equipment works for troubleshooting purposes. 
And then it's got a station finder or a chatter function. Basically, this turns the output of the decoder on and off at a one second rate, and it makes the valves chatter or vibrate. It makes it helps find in the valve boxes that are under mulch or under vegetation when you can't find the box. It's not perfect, but we found I've found quite a few valves that we couldn't find any other way with the chatter. Uh, the i dual system also had that. As far as the diagnostics on EZ, basically it's got the two, the LED on the module and the LED on the decoder. Um, the LED on the module, it's green when you're programming. If there's shorts in the field, just like the, the ACC did, the, the light will go red and it'll tell you that you, you got shorts out in the wire path, either a shorted decoder or wires touching each other. The, the light on the decoder will tell you, uh, it blinks when the decoder's operating. It's um, pretty good, pretty helpful. I wish all decoders had that. Maybe someday they will. But for right now, easy. It's the only one that does. So now I'll just, uh, just the, the tools that I recommend that everybody have. And top of my list is a multimeter. I can't imagine working on an irrigation system without a meter. Uh, the ICDHP is a great help. You're just going to need some miscellaneous hand tools, uh, you know, wire strippers, that kind of stuff. Remote radios help a lot. It saves a lot of time if you got a radio and you don't have to keep running back to the controller every time you do something. Some spare connectors, and you might be surprised that I tell you them should be the 3M DBRY6 connectors. I'd probably fix more stuff with this right here. It's just a spare decoder. And I actually have a decoder and a solenoid that I put alligator clips on the leads. That I can use the substitute in anywhere, anytime to determine what's going on. Spare solenoid, same thing. They don't have to have the clips on them, but it, it makes them convenient. We use the 24 volt power supply and, the, and a clamp on amp meter to find shorts out in the field. Um, decoder systems are notorious for having serve directors and decoders short out and take the whole system down. And that's what we use to find it. And then not absolutely necessary, but a wire locator is huge. You don't always know where the wires run. Fault finder helps to find broken wires. And and if it almost never is, but an as built drawing is a huge asset for troubleshooting these systems. And the one thing I advise everybody if you if there, if there is no as built and you're going to be maintaining that property for a while, as you figure stuff out, as you figure out where the wire route, document that. Scribble it down on a piece of paper and put it inside the controller. Then the next time you're doing something, you won't have to go figure it out all over again. It'll be there. As far as voltmeter, um, if you ask me for a recommendation, this is a Fluke 117. They're uh, 200 and Thirty forty dollar meter, they're 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 rugged. They're extremely accurate. The big thing is they're rugged. They last well. Uh, mine's been in my toolbox for ten years. I fly all over the country with it. The baggage handlers love to beat that box up. A lot of other stuff's broken, but my the voltmeter still works like the day I got it. Doesn't look like the day I got it, but it works just as good. As far as clamp on amp meters. Uh, there's there's a few different ones out there. x uh one of the higher end ones. It's very accurate. It's probably a little bit more accurate than what we need. It uh, tends to be a little bit fragile, though. I'm, uh, this is one that I recommend people use. Uh, Armada. This is a Pro 93. Last year they came out with one called Pro 95. It's just the next generation. Um, this thing can be your bolt meter as well as your amp meter. So you can you can just buy it. Just one takes care of both in the same kind of price range. The ICDHP is huge for troubleshooting. I can't imagine life without it working on our two-wire system. And then just some miscellaneous hand tools. And I put this slide up just to point something out. That, that box cutter was used, guys use it to, when they're, when they're installing to, to uh, get the outer jacket off of our wire off. Oh, you use the box cutter, and that's actually what 3M recommend, recommends you use. Um, 
what what we found was if you use a box cutter and all you got to do is score the wire and flex it and it'll and you can and it'll pull right off if you use a box cutter you, it tendencies to go right through the outer jacket into the in the wire insulation and put a nick in it and you won't even know you did it but a couple of years from now you will when you go back out and have to fix that wire where it corroded out where that nick is so i just warned i i advise everybody don't use box cutters or knives just use your wire tool all you got to do is put a little bit of score on the outside of that wire and it'll break off, off for you as far as you handheld remotes a huge time saver when you're when they're troubleshooting systems so you don't have to run back to the clock all the time. This is just an example of a 24 volt supply. This is not a hunter device. You, can, you can't buy these from us. Um, but we've, we've made them just because they, they really help troubleshooting. Um, but all it actually is is a transformer. The one I use looks a little bit different than that. It's just the it's a transformer out of an ACC controller, which is a 75 VA or a three amp transformer. We put a five amp fuse or circuit breakers better on the output side, on the 24 volt side. We usually put a, a fuse on the incoming side. What we want to make sure is we don't blow the circuit breaker at some place where we don't know where to get at, the, where we don't know where the panel's at. And then otherwise, it's just a 24 volt power supply. We're going to hook this up to the two wire path and use the amp probe to find problems. This is just an alternate to that. You can use any transformer, even smaller transformers, as long as you put a solenoid in line with one of the wires. The solenoid limits current down to about 300 milliamps, a little bit more than what a solenoid does. Um, basically, you can think of it as, it's like putting a piece of one inch pipe in the middle of a six inch main where we're restricting the amount of current that can go down the wire by putting that solenoid in there. Um, it just it, it makes it safer and it makes it gives us the ability to use a smaller transformer. So it's like most guys don't have a big three amp transformer sitting in their truck, but they most of them have one for like a Pro C in their truck, and you can use it as long as you put that solenoid in line with it. You need to have some connectors with you, and uh, surprise, surprise to tell you, you need the 3M connectors. Um, for, for decoder to two wire and two wire to two wire, use the 3M DBRY6 connector. For decoder to solenoid or decoder to decoder, I like the, I like the smaller one, the DBOB connector. And on for, for the solenoid, you can use anything you want. Again, same thing, it's only live for just, just moments and not even every day. This is a picture of my of my test decoder and my test solenoid. I just programmed the decoder to station 99. If I'm working on a on an ACC, I'll turn it to station 75. If I'm on an ACC2, um, or I'll turn it to 48. If I'm on a dual system, just depending on what system was what station number I set into it, and then I can I can just substitute it in and try to turn it on anytime I want. And the solenoid, just, you just hook it up and see what happens. Wire locator is nice. I don't really have a recommendation as what wire locator you use. Whatever one you have is, is fine. They all do pretty much the same thing. They're all slightly different. Everybody's got their favorites. I use a 501. It really doesn't matter. As long as you know how to use it is the main, main thing with the locators. Fault finders, it really doesn't matter because they're all the same. They're all using the same pattern. They're, they all do exactly the same thing, exactly the same way, and they pretty much all look the same. Hey, Dan, I got a question no, on uh, the, the fault finder, if you got a second. Sure. I, I get the question on the fault finder. Is it safe to use that tool on our decoder systems? Should they disconnect? The decoders they, on the path before they're going to use the fault finder, or, or uh, what's our you, recommendation for that? You you should you should disconnect when if you're using a fault finder, they induce tremendous current to into the ground, and it can damage decoders. Um, for for a short time period, they seem to survive it, but for uh, for long term, you you should uh, you should get rid of it. And at, at the point where you go to using a fault finder. 
you should have your wire problem located between two decoders, and it shouldn't be any big deal at all to disconnect them. The, the the locator, on the other hand, it's perfectly fine to leave that. The, that will not damage the decoders. Okay, so now we'll go, system, we'll go to actual troubleshooting. So, so and, and I encourage everybody to have a process that you use. Um, I, I certainly do. I go through pretty much the same steps no matter what. And the first thing I do is I go to the controller and see what the controller can tell me. The, they vary a bit. The ACC controller's got all kinds of alarm logs and stuff in them. They'll tell you all kinds of information about what's going on, what's been going on. Go find out what you can find out of the controller before you go any further. And you're looking for stuff like this. Is it, a, is it system level? Is the whole controller not working? Is it just individual stations or station that's not working? That kind of stuff, you know. So is it, you know, is it one station? Is it the whole site? Is it just part of it? Then the next thing I do is I'm going to go open up a couple bell boxes and see what's in there for connectors. I'm looking, you know, looking to see how they how they did everything, whether it's done, you know, they're using the right connectors, they're installed right, um, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Especially on old systems, I'm very curious as to what kind of connectors we're dealing with. Then the next thing I always ask is what what, what kind of constructions happened? What's changed? Um, you know, new sign. That's notorious. If they if they go pound a sign in the ground, it'll go right through the two wire path. It's amazing how often it happens. And one of the other ones is when they plant plant trees, and they don't even, they don't bother telling you that hey, there was a red and blue wire down there when we when we dug that hole. Um, we've we've seen all kinds of things. I had a job in Central Ohio a few years back. They had, uh, and don't, I'm not sure why, but they had put in the handicap crossings at all the crosswalks. The two wire path, for whatever reason, was directly underneath the sidewalks. So, every place where they put in one of them crossings, they cut the wires. Uh, you would have never have expected that, but that was, then they did know that that was what had changed, and it certainly was what happened. Um, another one of the questions I always ask is this, is this a new install? This, you know, just an existing system um, make, might make a little bit of difference the kind of stuff you're looking for. I run into this often enough that I put this on here, and that's especially in phased communities where they, it's real common and it's perfectly fine to run the wire over to the next the next section to be done, and and you know just leave it there until you get come to that section. If you do that. The, the wires need to be capped off. Uh, if you if you don't, it's like a it's like an antenna waiting for a lightning strike to hit them wires, and they'll start corroding and causing problems otherwise too. But yeah, is there an is there an as built? If not, you know, you make your own. So just some of the normal readings that you'd see: um, the two wire path voltage. You need to know your meter. Um, 30 to 37 volts. There's a fair amount of variance. If I hook my meter up to a two wire path, it'll, the voltage will be bouncing between high teens and something around 40 volts. Um, it is what it is. As long as you know what your meter reads it at, you know what's right. You know what's right and wrong. As far as uh, I've always, I always get asked if what the resistance should be. I don't use resistance much troubleshooting two wire paths, but it should be, in an ideal world, it should be higher than 600,000 ohms. There should be some resistance, but it's very, very high. Solenoid resistance, on the other hand, and I check solenoid resistance all the time, there's a lot of variation manufacturer to manufacturer, so I call it 10 to 60 ohms. Uh, 100 solenoid will read in the mid-20s, 25.8, right in that ballpark, typically. As far as decoder amperage, when it's connected to a controller and running off the normal voltage, three to four milliamps per decoder idle when they're not operating. When they are, are operating, it's 40 to 50 milliamps per solenoid. 
So if you've got a decoder running two solenoids, it's going to be close to 100 milliamp, what you're going to see for current draw. Them numbers change dramatically when we, when we go over using 24 volts. But like I say, rule of thumb with the, on the controller, each decoder should draw about that. You can use that and look at the, the current draw on the controller to try to get a gauge on health. So I told you, I, break, I try to break, I try to simplify things as well as I can, and I break problems down on two wire systems and three things. Either a single station, in other words, you just got individual stations that don't, that don't work. Or multiple stations, you got groups of stations that don't work. Or usually when I get the phone call, all the stations don't work. Two wire systems are notorious for when they get a shorted out decoder or surge arrestor, the controller sees that high current draw, knows it could damage the controller and the controller turns itself off. It'll call it like a line fault. It's got various you know, overcurrent, but that's that's what happens. So as far as single stations, I use this process. Check the controller. Let's make sure the controller that the stations programmed into the controller, that kind of stuff. Just make sure you know that the controller's set up right. Check the valve, make sure we got water on, make sure the flow control is not cranked all the way down, that kind of stuff. We just want to make sure the valve's working. You know, like turn the bleed screw on the valve and see if it'll turn on. And then being a single station, these are usually connection kind of problems. Not necessarily they can be a bad decoder, they can be a bad solenoid. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check connections. I literally, if you've got a station that doesn't work, it's just a single station, I go to that valve box. I grab a hold of the decoder and I pull and see what wants to come apart. Thus, we find more problems. We find more problems. This kind of stuff is just connections that have fallen apart, weren't made right to begin with. Um, but that's the first thing you do. just yank, pull on the connectors, make sure that everything's all good. And if it is, then we can just test voltage on the two wire path, make sure we got voltage coming into the decoder. Should be in that, this range. Um, when you get way out on a wire path, it could, you could see voltages as low as 20 volts. That's usually telling you there's something there's something up if it's that low, unless you're on a two mile long path. Then you should be able to just install your test decoder and prove whether the decoder works or not. Turn on the station if it turns on great. If it doesn't, it's probably the solenoid. So we could either check the resistance of the solenoid for the 10 to 60 ohm range. Oh yeah, anytime. And it doesn't, if you're checking resistance, if you're checking ohms on, on anything, you need the power, it's got to be turned off first. Um, ohm meters do not like AC voltage. And then turn, install your test solenoid. You should be able to, just them steps should be able to get you through any, any time you just have a single station that doesn't work. I say as often as not on single stations, it's, it's a wiring connection problem. If you got the ICDHP, you can save yourself a couple steps. You, you still gotta, you still gotta make sure the controller's okay, and you gotta make sure the valve works. You probably ought to check the connections because it's probably what's going to be wrong. And beyond there, you can hook the ICDHP up to the decoder and tell everything else about it. We can check the voltage, the amperage, and programming all, all at once. If, if if everything looks good, then we're either just going to install our test decoder or or the test solenoid to, to get it from there. That's that's the easy one. So here comes next one: multiple stations. So the same thing. It's always start at the, always start at the controller. So the first question is: Are are they all on the same wire path? Are these are these stations that aren't working together? If they're not, if they're on separate wire paths, they're just individual, they're just single station problems and, and treat them that way. Just do, just go through them one at a time. If they're together though, then that's something different. If they're all together, the first thing you want to do is check wire connections. Um, usually when it's multiples, it's wire. So, so you want to check wherever the problem begins, the first, the first decoder that doesn't work, you want to go there first and check. Like I say, it's always the same thing. Just grab the grab the connectors, 
and pull on them, see if you can get one to pull apart for you, or see if you can find the broken wire. Then you can test the voltage on the, you can test the voltage there, but I'm gonna go back one step. Forgot about something. If, if you don't find anything where the problem starts, go back to the last decoder that is working fine and check the connections there. Make sure you don't have an outgoing wire connection that's come apart on you. Because it could just, could just as easily be there. So from there, we're just gonna test for voltage on the two wire pale. At both, again, at both locations, where wherever the problems show, first one that shows up and the last one that works, it's going to be your problem is going to be at one of them two locations or in between. Then once you get to that point, we're, we're going to check resistance on the two wire path. Um, again, like I say, I don't use resistance of the two wire path as as much of an indicator. It should be higher than the one K ohm. It should be a lot higher than that. But but I've seen readings down that low and everything was okay. We can say if you're checking resistance, turn the power off first. Um, now checking wire continuity. In other words, by this, what we're saying is that we we're if we're down to the point where we think that the problems between two valve boxes, checking wire continuity. What we're going to do is we're going to go to one end of the wire path and twist the two wires together, and that literally twist the red and blue wires together. We're going to go back to the other end and check for continuity. When you do that, that, that reading should be very low. It should be, it should be single digit ohm reading. It should be very low. That tells you the continuity, or you can just, do, if your meter's got an audible continuity tone, you can just see if it tones. Once you've proven that the wires, wires all intact, now we do see, doesn't happen a lot, but we do see times when, when one decoder can affect everything downstream of it. And in that case, we're just gonna check and replace that, to, you know, we're gonna substitute a different decoder and see if that takes care of the problem. I've also seen strings of decoders all blown up from lightning too, where it's a group that way. But like I say, at that point, we're just gonna, we're gonna make, we're gonna get this decoder working and see what we get afterwards. Okay, so this is where things things get interesting. Like I say, this is usually where I get involved on most two, troubleshooting two wire situations. Nothing works. So what do you do? Where do you start? Well, you start at the controller. Check the controller. Reset the controller. A controller is a piece of electronic that's a microprocessor, so just like your smartphone is, just like your computers are. Sometimes they just need turned off. They get electrically confused and they just need to be reset. From there, as long as that's not what it is, the, the steps we take is we're gonna disconnect all the wires in the controller, no matter how many wire paths it has, we're gonna take them all off. And we're gonna prove the controller works. And we just use, the, we use again, we use the spare decoder and solenoid. I literally hook them to each other and then hook that to the terminal strip of the controller and see if I can turn that decoder on. The way decoder controllers work, if it can turn one station on, it can turn any station on. So you wanna prove your controller works or not first. Uh, nothing sucks worse than spend a half a day trying to figure out what's wrong in the field and find out if actually the controller was bad. And then what we're gonna do, once we prove the controller works, we hooked our spare decoder up and it, and it turned on, we're gonna start reconnecting wire paths one at a time. Trying to find the wire path that causes the problem. Just by doing this, sometimes you can get most of the system working by doing nothing other than just disconnecting that wire. Not certainly not perfect, but half of the system operating is a lot better than none. Then there's a couple ways we can go. We'll use what we call the half method. This is the old school way of troubleshooting these systems. Um, basically, you're just going to disconnect wires to find problems or we're gonna use a 24 volt power supply and a, and a clamp on amp beater to find the problem. Um, much faster, easier, cleaner way to do it. Anyways, here's how the half method works. Um, basically, we're gonna check the controller, make sure the controller's working. Then we're gonna to go to the first connection outside of the controller and test there too. This is somewhat a reality check. I think I told you before, we see more problems at the first decoder in line than any other decoder. It's not like a high percentage, but 
it, that, that makes sense to do it there. And then from there, we're going to start breaking this, this wire path in, into halves. We're just going to go, hey, we're going to go halfway out the wire path, disconnect the wire, and see what happens. The one thing I advise everybody when you do this, you don't have to disconnect both wires. You don't have to disconnect both the red and the blue, but you got to disconnect one of them and, and stay consistent. I disconnect blue wires. I have no reason why it's the blue wire I use other than I, do, I disconnect blue wires. Um, but you do need to stay steady. If you disconnect red on one and blue on the other, and that extra wire, in both cases, touching ground, you can get a, you can get a current path through them. But you don't have to disconnect both, just one of them. That'll tell you. So you disconnect, you go back to the controller, and you see what happens. Oh, yeah, if there's key splices, if you've got splices out there, they're like they're logical places to test. Because then you can disconnect three wire paths at once. So you can, you know, you can have figure out which one of the outgoing paths has the problem on it. Just try to be as logical as you can just about how you go about doing this. Then we're just going to go, you know, we're going to disconnect. We're going to see what happens. We disconnect at a point, and the controller now starts working. I know my problem's further out. If I disconnect and the controller's still screwing up, I know my problem's between there and the controller. So you're just going to keep disconnecting and disconnecting until you find your problem. This is a messy, dirty, time consuming method it does work we've been doing this for over 20 years it works if you don't have a clamp on the amp meter this is how you have to find the severe shorts we've never found any other method either the half method or using an amp probe that works and works consistently you can go disconnect every controller go down the wire path one at a time it'll take you even longer so now if you do happen to have a 24 volt power supply, what we do is we're just going to, we're going to disconnect the, the wire path from the controller and hook it up to the transformer, turn 24 volts on, and then we can use the clamp on amp pro. Do not connect the, the 24 volt transformer to the controller unless you want to buy a new controller. And we're like I say, we're just going to connect the, 24 volts to the wire path, and we're going to use the amp meter um, and to get a reading. When we do this, we're only checking, you only check one of the wires, and it doesn't matter red or blue, it really makes no difference at all. You should, the current should be the same on both wires. If the current was different on one of the wires than the other, it's telling you you got a, you got a nick in the wire and it's bleeding some voltage off the ground. It's probably not what's causing your main problem, but it's telling you you got something wrong. So when, when we do this, we're going to see quite a bit of variation in the milliamp reading for the current draw for coders. <laughs> Typically, if you're hooked up directly to a transformer with no solenoid in there, the readings tend to be 7 or 8 milliamps each. Uh, we, I see quite a bit of variation. Our golf decoder is quite a bit lower. Um, some of our competitors decoders read quite a bit lower um, and then when you put if you put the solenoid in line with the transformer then readings drop tremendously and then, and then there's quite a bit of variation as to what they might be but they will all draw some and they'll draw at least a milliamp even the good ones if they read more if they draw more than 10 milliamps you might as well replace them they're bad um, and all the stuff reads about the same, whether they're single station, multi-station, sensor decoders, they all draw about the same amount of current. Now, the way you do it, if if I see a current draw over 500 milliamps, even with my big power supply, I put I put the solenoid in line. It's just a safety thing at that point. I've seen them draw four, four amps before. That's tremendous. Four amps can catch stuff on fire. It, it's dangerous. I've literally seen ground wire on an ICD decoder melt right through a piece of poly when it was drawn high amperage like that. So like I say if I see over 500 mils, I put a solenoid in line. If I see less than that, I don't put the solenoid in line because it's easier to find the shorts if you don't have it there because the readings are higher. 
then it's like the half method, only we don't have to disconnect anything. So we're going to hook it up. We're going to get a reading. I usually, same thing, I usually go to the first valve box and get a reading there just as a reality check before I go any further. Then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go halfway out or whatever makes sense. And then, but all I got to do is like get in there, get on, get on the wire and read it. So you don't want to read the individual decoders until you get right down to the final end. So you're narrowing down on the actual, the actual one. You just grab one of the, the heavy wires, like I say, either red or blue, get a reading. If it's, if it's high, your problem is further out. If it's low, then your problem is between you and the controller. So what you're actually doing is looking for that break. You're looking for the point where the where the that current draw number goes down dramatically. And once you've found that, then you just back up to your problem. It's showing what it looks like if you put the solenoid in line. Like I say, it doesn't matter if you hook it to the red or blue wire. It really makes no difference. And then get a reading, and you always the, the clampons only on one of the wires. And Again, it doesn't matter which one. Make sure you take them off of the controller first. Put the solenoid in for protection, especially if you're using a smaller transformer. Then you can check anywhere. There's just some other examples of some stuff we've come up with. They're in a pinch work. This is an ACC controller, and we just took a conventional station module, took the decoder module out, put a conventional module in there, and then we can just turn a station on there to be our 24 volt supply. If you do this, you definitely need to put the solenoid in line because that module is only capable of about three quarters of an amp. If you put it in there and you're drawing over an amp, it'll just fry the module and then you really didn't accomplish anything. Easy decoder, um, same thing. Only on the easy, because it's a 24 volt system, we still may need used clamp on if we got shorts out in the field. But we can just use that module with a solenoid in line instead of you know instead of having to bring in a separate transformer to make sure you have on the station. Then we're just gonna we're gonna clamp on, see what the milliamp reading is. In that case, it looks pretty good, 216.8. So there's definitely something wrong out there. Um, like I say, we always go to the first box first, and then from there, you're just going to go out until you find the drop from the high reading to a low reading. Um, typically, when you're doing this, if you've got a solenoid in there and you're reading in the 200 range, when you get past that, that number is going to drop down to well less than 100. Um, just depends how severe the short is. You can't, the exact numbers don't mean anything. We're just looking for the drop. When it drops from a high number to a low number, you went past the problem and then you back up to the problem. And then you're going to just clamp right on the individual decoder's wire once we think we're narrowed down to it and prove that that decoder is what's drawing the high current draw. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Um, I just want to stress to everybody on the line, I'm not sure what everybody's comfort or skill level is with troubleshooting two-wire irrigation and coming from someone who spent years doing the half method. The ability by using a solenoid and a clamp on amp meter will take you from a novice to a pro in 10 seconds. So if, if there's anything critical you take from this is how to use the clamp on amp meter to find it and, and to troubleshoot without taking all of those connections apart. I mean, I can remember it was in South Bend, Indiana on a sports field and I was with you when I figured out how to do this. It's a, it's a, this is how you become a pro in troubleshooting two-wire irrigation systems. This this literally took troubleshooting, taking it took it from taking days to taking hours to fix systems. Um, one of a couple of things that uh, just to, when you're when you're doing this and you find a bad decoder, we just cut that decoder out. Just just take your take your wire tool and snip the red and blue wires on that decoder. You should do it one at a time. You don't want to short them to each other, and then and then continue on. It's real common to have more than one decoder shorted out on a wire path at the same time, especially if there's been an electrical search. Um, don't just don't just when you find one replace it. Um, if you do, and then you got another short out there, you just got to start the process all over again. So, like I say, when you find a bad decoder, just cut it out and continue on.
you say you're just, you're just simply looking for when the when that when the high number drops to a lower number. So now just we're almost done. I'm going to show you just some examples. Try to drive this this stuff home now. So this is just a very very basic system. A controller, ten decoders. So using the half method, we got no stations operate. Controllers probably saying overload and it won't do anything. Uh, might say line fall could depend on what controller is, what kind of messages you're getting. But that's all. The first step is to disconnect the wires from the controller and test the controller. So if your test decoder up to the controller and make sure you can run it. If you can, we know the controller is good. Then we do that says we definitely have a problem out in the field. Then we always go to the first location and, and check there first. Um, just a, this, it's not necessary. It's a good habit. It, we find that we find problems right there often enough that it's worthwhile doing. And then from there, once we prove that that's that's okay, we're going to go halfway or about halfway out and check. We're going to literally disconnect the wire, see what happens. Um, you can either, if, if there's two people, you can hook your solenoid, your decoder and solenoid up and have them try to turn it on from the controller. Or if you got a blue belt radio, you can use it. Otherwise, you got to go back to the controller and try it and see what happens. So when we check there, it, you know, it's all good. So that tells me the problem's further out. If we go halfway out or thereabouts again, do the same thing. Okay, it didn't work at that point. So we went past our problem. And now it's back up. That Murphy's Law says that the first one would be good, and then it's got to be this one. And it was. So you would just replace that decoder, cut that decoder out, test, and then replace it. So that's how the half method works. Um, if, if all of our wire paths were only 10 decoders long, it would, it would be pretty quick and easy to do. Um, being that these are 99 or bigger station controllers, a little bit more involved. So as far as using the clamp on, the concepts are pretty much the same. So we got this controller, and each device on there is going to consume about the same amount of electricity. It's going to use the same, it's going to be drawn the same number of milliamps. Just to make the numbers nice and easy, I'm going to say each, each decoder draws 10 milliamps. So if everything was working good, these are, if you went out through there, that's the readings you would get at some points. So when you have a problem and you're drawing high current, you got high current draw and the controller's probably turning itself off, we're going to hook the transformer up and get a reading. And so, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go and check at every spot, but if you did, this is the numbers you would see. So we got 2,000 milliamps or 2 amps at the controller. That's quite a bit. So now you can just go out and you can see what we're looking for. We're looking for where the number breaks. Where if it went from 1950 to, to 40, we know our problem's right in here. It has to be. And it is. If you, if you had it set up like that, you didn't have the solenoid on there and it was drawn two amps like that, that decoder would be hot to the touch. You might not even be able to touch it and be so hot. It'll certainly be warm. That's one of the things I do when I'm when I'm using a power supply. I'll I'll reach in and just touch the decoder with my hand. If you find a warm one, it's bad, and you re, and you cut it out. But like I say, I cut them out and then see what I got because a lot of times there's more than one. So just another another example. Um, these are pretty pretty realistic numbers. Seven and three quarters milliamps each. That, that's real. That's a real typical voltage to see with a 20, with 24 volt power supply. So these are just the readings you'd see at different points along the line. 217 would be normal with with that many decoders hooked up. That's just the readings you'd see at different places. So on a more realistic system, it might look like this. Still the same same current draw, still the same number of decoders. So the current draw didn't change at the controller any. And obviously, it's going to be different at different points. Like if there, we're only seeing that one decoder out on the end. Here, we're seeing that whatever that is, that those six. There, it's those seven, so slightly higher. 
you know, and so on and so on. Them are all the normal readings. That's what you'd expect to see. So if we have a short, we hook up power supply, we might see numbers more like this. So check here, 2318. That's pretty high. That's high enough I would actually put a solenoid in line. You wouldn't have to if you've got a big transformer, but it's certainly high, and we should be able to find the problem this way. So now it's just a matter of going out and start breaking it down. And like I say, we call it the half method, um, basically, but we're going to go out to a T-splice and check it. And when we go out here, this one and check, we read 47. And like, when I go to that box, there's a three-way splice there. I'm going to check all three wires. We look at the incoming and the two outgoings. Um, don't don't just check one because if you check the outgoing one and the problems in the other direction, you won't even know that that's what happened. So we but we got good readings there, so we're gonna go back to the other T splice and check there. Um, and here we got the okay, there it is. There's the high number. So we definitely got a problem. And again, like I say, we check all three wires and be able to see that the one going down that branch is high. So we're just gonna go halfway down or whatever you know, wherever is convenient and makes sense. Get a reading 39. So now we're past our problem. We know it's between the T splice and that box. So now we back up and check. When we check here, it's way high. We go to this box, it's high there too. So now it's just a matter of connecting to that decoder and confirming that the decoder is bad. We definitely know it's in between them two boxes at this point. When we check there, it is. It's that decoder. Like I say, you just cut that one out. And, and then see what you get. Hopefully that's all it is and you're done. So that's what I got for you. Thanks for joining everybody. Appreciate yep. your time today. If you have further yep, questions, Thanks, you need more info, feel free to reach out to your local Hunter and FX sales rep. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys on another webinar uh, real soon. Take care and be safe. Great, thanks guys.